Good morning, everyone. And thank you all for having me here today, Joanna, Luis, Maria, and Claudia. It is an honor and a privilege to come to Portugal for yet a third time. Now, I'm able to travel to Portugal and other countries because I'm free. If I was a slave, I would be unable to travel to go where I want to and to work the hours that I've worked, that I want to work. As someone who is free, as an American, as a woman, as a human, I've been able to travel to Africa for 15 times. I've been to Uganda, Ethiopia, Ghana. I've been to Costa Rica, Cuba, Sri Lanka, all over Europe, Canada, Mexico, and many other places. And it is truly an honor and a privilege to be able to do this. I take my freedom seriously. It is a human right, but it hasn't always been afforded to my ancestors as well as to many people today. There are approximately 27 million plus people enslaved around the world. So my goal today is to incite a sense of moral outrage about the injustice and the, pre and the prevalence of trafficking around the world in the many forms that it persists. And I, will want, I want all of us to leave here thinking, what can I do to stop trafficking? What can I do to educate others about trafficking? And what can I do to not be complicit in trafficking being promoted and sustained? And I will talk to you a lot about your role and my role in labor trafficking around the world. I think something's going on here. Slaves. How many slaves work for you? Do you all have any idea how many slaves work for you? Do you even know what that means when I say that? I'm talking about the number of products that we all consume that are made by slaves. I want you all to write down this term here, how many slaves work for you, and later on today, Google this. And take the 10-minute survey to talk about the products that you purchase and how it results in all of us consuming products possibly made by slaves. So please go to footprint.org, I think it's called footprint.org. Look this up or Google how many slaves work for you. When it comes to the products that we wear, the products that we use, it's a good chance that many of us are using things every single day whose things that were built and produced by slaves. So I took this test yet again last night, this survey, about 10 minutes long. And I'm a very conscientious consumer. I don't wear diamonds, I don't wear gold. I shop from very select stores and very select brands. I haven't eaten meat, seafood, and poultry in 27 years. I'm a diligent consumer. And yet, according to my results last night, at least 62 slaves have worked for me. I find that abominable. It's unacceptable. So although I try to be conscientious in what I consume and how I consume things, even I, a very conscientious consumer, has products in my possession today where at least 62 slaves have produced. That is problematic for me on every level. One slave is too many, let alone 62. And so I want to encourage you all to take the survey as well about how many slaves work for you. There's something going on with this here. Are you aware that slavery takes place all around the world 365 days out of the year, 24 hours a day? Many slaves work up to 20 hours a day, six to seven days a week. The no mercy, doesn't matter if they're not feeling well, they just had a baby, if the sun is tight, if the conditions are cold, it doesn't matter, the work has to be done. Because in the land of supply and demand, the supply has to be put forward. It has to be met if there's a demand for it. And consumers, we're the ones driving this, the demand for all these different products. So as many as 2.8 billion people on the planet struggle to survive on less than two hours, two dollars, US dollars a day. There are about 7.6 billion people in the world, and you can see about 2.8 billion people are living on less than two US dollars a day. And I often hear people say, especially my fellow Americans, two dollars a day is a lot in Africa, 
or other parts of the world. And I've traveled to many parts of the world, and $2 is not a lot of money anywhere I've been. It is not a lot of money, and I find it hard to believe that 2.8 billion people are living on less than two US dollars a day. And that includes those individuals who are working 20 hours a day as slaves. Again, that's problematic. So if our overconsumption of food, material things, and products do not cease and desist immediately, slavery will always be present in this world. We, again, have to be conscious about how much we consume and think about why we are consuming it. Did you know that 20% of the world's population is consuming 75% of the Earth's resources? That's a problem. 20% 20, 20 of the individuals in the world are consuming 75% of the Earth's resources. That is not okay. Did you know that 12% of the world's population, specifically North America and Western Europe, account for 60% of private consumption spending? We have to hold these countries and individuals accountable. We have to own up to our consumption of goods that are directly affecting those around us. In terms of Southeast Asia and Sub-Saharan Africa, one third of those individuals only account for 3.2% of private consumption spending, which means they're doing a lot better than the rest of the world. But I'm not quite sure if it's by choice. I don't think it's by choice. So this also speaks to the issue of inequity and injustice and inequality as well. And we need to be very conscious of that. So in terms of some global stats, an estimated 27 million people were enslaved in 2016. Approximately 32 billion to 150 billion dollars are made on profits alone from illegal work and sex and other type of activities regarding human trafficking. And in terms of the United States, the estimate is about 14.5, 14,500 to 17,500 are brought to the U.S. alone, specifically for human trafficking purposes. And this also sometimes includes individuals who come through the, the country legally through H-1A and H-1B visas, seasonal workers, agricultural, non agricultural. Sometimes these individuals are allowed to come to the United States to do jobs that Americans won't do. Unfortunately, only to be plagued with um, forced labor trafficking, and that's problematic as well. So for those who continue to believe that coming to America is all great, not for everyone. Coming to America is not always so great. It's pretty beneficial to the United States when we have the best of the best around the world working in our country, and it's also great for the United States when we have people who are forced to do jobs that no American is willing to do. So people from all over the world end up in the United States. And I just want to say for the record, the United States of America is not the land of milk and honey for everyone. And it's really important that people get that message out there. So in terms of the markets, where are people working? Let me give you an idea about the profit again in terms of money. In the private economy alone, in terms of profit, $150 billion was made in 2015. That's a lot of money especially when some people in part of those numbers are getting little to nothing for their 20-hour days to give you a context for the degree of money being made. Again, just in terms of agriculture industry, including forestry and um, fishing, $9 billion being made. And I'm throwing these numbers out for a reason to show you how much money is being made and how little is being given to lots of people who actually work very long, strenuous, demanding hours as people in forced um, labor positions. Qatar and the World Cup. Every time I think about major world events, whether it's the Olympics, the World Cup, or some other event, I immediately cringe and get sick to my stomach. Because I think, how in the world are we going to produce a city, basically a city, in four years? It is difficult to produce a city for these sporting events in four years without the use of slaves. It is estimated that 4,000 workers would die for the upcoming preparations for the Qatar World Cup. You can look at documentaries yourself online to the number of people who are sent back in bags, body bags, dead from injuries sustained while trying to build facilities so we can be entertained by sporting events. 
And it's not that serious. It's not that serious. Construction, in terms of manufacturing and mining, mining make up 50% of labor trafficking jobs and activities. And I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit more about manufacturing and how all of that relates to you and I as consumers. So where do people work? Again, right here, I want to talk a little bit more about agriculture, industrial jobs, and services. So who are the vulnerable? The most vulnerable people who may be trafficked are the most vulnerable in the world, impoverished communities, refugees, migrant workers, and children. I know that many of us cannot fathom children having to work long, dangerous, laborious hours, but it is a reality around the world. And as far as I can tell, very few people really care about that. So you talk about stolen lives and childhood. These children are the epitome of stolen lives, and stolen generations, and stolen um, developmental years. So let's talk about women. We know that women play a huge role as well in terms of labor trafficking. And unfortunately for women, not only are Many of them traffic for labor purposes, but it's a double whammy also for sex purposes. So women earn 10% of the global income, yet possess less than 1% of the world's prosperity. We know there are about 100 women to 102 men. It's not like there's not a lot of women out there. It's not like they're not working and going to other countries to send money back home to their families. We are alive and well in large numbers, yet we are not able to um, enjoy the benefits of our efforts. 10% of the global income and 1% of the world's property. But that sets up a context for vulnerability and willing to take chances so that you can put food on the table for yourself, your siblings, and your families. This also includes men, by the way. So overconsumption is horrible. How many of you would say you're avid shoppers? Shop quite a bit. How many would confess to that? You got just a little bit too, too many shoes than you really need. Too many watches, pans, electronics, material things. Oh, so you're just model citizens around here, right? <laughs> I find that hard to believe. Everyone looks pretty good in here. Think about your consumption. Let's talk about some of those things. So I would have to honest, honestly take an own ownership. I'm part of the problem. And I think that all of you are too. And we're going to talk about how all of us are complicit. And by the way, I'm going to talk about different products that we use. I do not encourage you, however, to come to work or class naked. You're going to have to buy something. I'm not being that strict. I'm just saying be thoughtful about your consumption, OK? Electronics, how many of you own a smartphone? Can you raise them up for me? How many smartphones in the room? Aren't they convenient and pretty nice? Absolutely. How many of you even put an order when a new phone is about to be released? How many of you put an advanced order in? No one does? Do any of you know how that impacts trafficking when you put advanced orders in for products? What it does, it makes the slaves have to work even harder and faster to meet those demands. I would encourage all of us to just wait. When we want some product that's coming out, wait until it's available and on the shelves. Do not pre-order it. Just wait. They're already working 20 hours a day. Do you want them to work 23 hours a day, 24 hours a day? So just wait. It's a good chance if you own a cell phone, you have, you have, you have an electronic that has been built by some slave somewhere around the world. If you own a cell phone, some part of that cell phone has a hand that has been touched by a slave. So 99.9% .9 chance that's the reality of every cell phone that we own. And most of us have them around the world. Clothing. I already talked to you a little bit about clothing. How, many, how much clothing do you have? How many of you like a good deal? Low price, cheap, good prices on clothing, or you're pretty happy when you see them? You feel like you have a good deal, right, when you get a bargain on clothing when you go shopping. But is it really a bargain when it's made by a slave in a sweatshop? Do you and will you keep clothing makers accountable? Will you boycott a brand that you know are using slaves somewhere in the supply chain, even if it means paying more money up the, down the road? Are you willing to do that? Most people are not willing to pay more. A lot of us don't even care where the clothing came from. 
and the fact that most of us look at the back of our necks on our clothing, clothing is probably going to say made in where? Bangladesh, China, some Southeast Asian country. I know there are a lot of folks in Asia where there aren't that many to make all these clothes for us around the world and not have to be subjected to labor um, trafficking somewhere along the way. We need to be really mindful of our consumption of clothing. Oops, sorry. Makeup. How many of us wear makeup in this room? Do you care where it comes from? Have you thought about where it comes from? Are there any dangers in where it comes from? Yes, some people have, have thought about it. They're conscientious consumers, and some just do not care. As long as it's shiny and pretty, it's OK. But would it change your mind if you found out that there were people, oh, sorry, that there were people, men, women, and children in India somewhere working in these mines, being exposed to mica? that causes long-term pulmonary disorders, scar tissue of the lungs, and other disorders. Does that matter to you that these folks are working under these horrible conditions, long hours, sometimes 20 hours a day, to make products that you and I wear on our faces? Do we need that much makeup or that kind of makeup? Hotel rooms. How many of you love to have your room clean every time you go to a hotel? Love to have it clean every day. Yeah, most of us want to be paying two, three, four hundred dollars, euros, pesos, CDs, shillings, wherever it is. And we want someone to come in and clean that room. I understand. Just, you know, you're paying all this money. But would it matter to you if we found out that these women and men were etched and told and demanded to work, to, I'm sorry, to clean about five rooms an hour, up to 40 rooms a day, and severely penalized if they do not meet that quota? When I understood this, Tara, I learned this a few years ago, we had a major conference come up in the United States, a huge conference. And we found that a major hotel chain in the United States, all over Europe as well, was using slaves. We had to cancel our conference because we refused to stay in those hotels. That is a reality. As a result, now, when I travel in my hotels, I never get service. I clean my own rooms. I may go on a hallway to get a towel, empty my trash but I never want to be part of that demand to meet that quota per hour. So we can do some little small things ourselves to prevent that extra demand of those workers. Seafood, how many of you love seafood? Shrimp, chick, fish, scallops, lots of people love seafood. You too, Claudia, right? You love seafood? Have you, <laughs> have you thought about where it comes from, how you get it? Some people have. Most folks don't even care, haven't even thought about it. It's just sitting on their plate and it looks really good. But would it matter to you if you found out that there were men who were made to work on boats 40 days, 50 days at a time. When they become rebellious or they refuse to continue to work, they're sometimes thrown overboard. Working in very hot conditions, very cold conditions. Peeling shrimp 40 pounds a day. Can you imagine peeling shrimp for 40, 40 pounds of shrimp a day? There's no shrimp in the world worth me peeling 40 pounds a day. I don't eat shrimp anyway, but if I did eat shrimp, I would probably stop after having understand seafood tra sea trafficking. Keep going here. Gold. Gold is beautiful. And I'm not saying you're not allowed to have gold. I'm just saying there are some consequences to having such beautiful jewelry. There are consequences. Have any of you ever thought about where that gold comes from? Where it comes from? Not many people. Would it matter to you if you learned that the gold that you were shopping was going to, was going to um, fund insurgents against a legitimate government? And there were folks dying for the sake of gold. Would it matter to you? You're funding potentially insurgents who are trying to overturn a legitimate government. Does that matter to you? That people are dying trying to retrieve gold so we can wear it on our bodies. Does it matter that little boys are being told to go in the large bodies of dirty water to again sip for gold and other minerals? Fruit and vegetables. Have you ever thought about the consequences of fruit and vegetables, how we get them, how other countries are able to export them to us, how we're able to consume them throughout the year? How is it that we're able to get fruits that are out of season 
in season in your country throughout the year. It's quite an honor and a privilege. I've had the opportunity to meet tomato pickers, immaculate tomato pickers in Florida, where they're asking people to just, retailers to pay one more penny, one more penny, one more penny per pound so that they can lift everyone out of slavery and forced laboring throughout the country. And many stores have come on board and many have not. As a result, many restaurants and stores are still being boycotted across the states because they won't pay tomato pickers one more pound, one more penny per pound. And these men I've met personally, they have to carry 50 pounds on their shoulder from the field to the truck, from the field to the truck, from the field to the truck all day long. Neck problems, back problems are constant. Oops, chocolate. How many of you love chocolate? Most people around the world love chocolate. It tastes good, many people desire it, but it's not the easiest thing to get and it's laborious work to get it from one form to another form. And there are some people who have been um, charged companies, large companies, multi-billion dollar companies of not being mindful of their supply chain and not caring if the people who are doing the laborious work are little boys in Ghana, Cote d'Ivoire not caring about the number of kids who are part of cocoa plantations. Have any of you ever been to a plantation, banana plantation, cocoa plantation, pineapple plantation? I've seen those places in different countries. It's hard, hot work. So we should really care about the products that are being made, especially this small child working so hard. Tea. Tea's a really big thing in Portugal, right? Yes. How many folks um, plant and, and harvest their own tea in this country? their own backyards. Tea, one person, two people, wonderful. It's an option, you know, we can do our own tea. It's an option, I see two of you do. Would it matter to you then, there are people who are being trafficked on tea plantations, working long, hot hours to harvest this product for us. And I'm almost done with my example, so I'm trying to make a point here. Soccer, over 240 million people play soccer. Millions more watch it. Have you ever thought about how they make soccer balls? Is soccer the most, um, the most popular sport in the world? I believe it is, despite what the USA thinks. <laughs> I think it's probably the most popular sport in the world. You all call it football, football. So it's very popular. But would it matter to you in terms of soccer balls if you knew that some people were making them under these conditions? Some are in sweatshops, some are in private little sh homes themselves, working, again, sometimes 20 hours a day, sometimes 30 days straight when there's a high demand for soccer balls or footballs around the country, around the world, I should say. So a lot of the products that we're using, we haven't thought a lot about, but it's important to think about these products. Now I'm almost done here. Diamonds. We have been socialized that diamonds are a girl's best friend, right? The bigger the diamond, the more he loves us, the more she loves us, the more he cares about us, probably his income level, her income level. We have been socialized to believe that diamonds mean a lot to many people, not in all countries, but especially in the West, how important diamonds are. Does it matter to you how the diamonds were retrieved? Again, if they were blood diamonds, if folks worked long, long, laborious hours to retrieve them, would it matter to you are there, are there alternatives to, dim to diamonds? You know, people who get upset when folks criticize the whole diamond industry, some would say, well, there's the Kimberly process. Well, we can understand, some, some will argue, diamond jewels in particular, would say we are pretty clear of the chain, how the diamonds are retrieved from the very beginning end up in stores through the Kimberly process. But there are actually critics that say as well, although the Kimberly process is designed to really trace diamonds from beginning to end, there is not a 100% guarantee of even that actually. I was on a plane coming to Portugal just last year and I met a diamond seller on the plane. And we talked about selling diamonds. And of course he wants to sell diamonds and that was his, obviously his, his intention and his motivation. But I said to him, even through the Kimberly process, can you guarantee that the diamonds that you sell are 99.9% .9 slave free. And he said, I cannot guarantee that. How could I possibly guarantee that even though the Kimberly process? It's very difficult. 
it's very difficult to, to do that. But what he did tell me, to tell everyone else in this room in particular, was what he told me last year, was there are alternatives, lab-created diamonds, cubic zirconias. There's all kinds of stones that are alternatives that we need to consider as well. So are you disgusted yet? Yes. yes. How many slaves do you think work for you at this point? Give me some numbers. I know 62 works for me. How many do you think work for you? More Based than on? 150. More than 150 easily. Any other thoughts? Pardon me? Can't imagine. Probably a lot. And as I said to you all early on, one slave is too many, let alone 62 or 150. So it's our job, I would encourage you, first of all, to take that little survey to see how many you actually, how many work for you, and then do something about it. So how many slaves do you own? Take the time, please, to figure it out. But we can do something about it. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about doing something about it at this point, then, in terms of setting slaves free, at least from what you can do on your end. So let me just quickly define what is labor trafficking. In fact, do you all know what it is, labor trafficking is? Let me give you the official definition from the UN. <clears throat> so I'm going to talk about the protocol. And the protocol is applicable to many nations that have signed on to this particular convention to end labor trafficking, sex trafficking, and other forms of trafficking around the world. So let me just define it for you here. The first is going to be the X. What is trafficking? It involves recruiting, transporting, transferring, harboring, or receiving a person. Okay, that's how it's what it is. And how do they do it? Force, fraud, coercion, abuse, deception of an abuse of power. So you have the X and you have the means. You're talking about recruiting these people, using these people through some means outside of their will. And what for? the purpose of exploitation. Human trafficking is all about exploitation and profits for the trafficker. So human rights. Clearly, trafficking violates human rights. How many of you have ever read the entire Declaration of Human Rights? United Nations Universal Declaration of Human Rights, 30 articles. One person in the entire room has read all 30 articles. Two or three of you all? I would encourage you all to leave here today as well and to read the entire declaration. It's just 30 articles. Read them because we cannot promote them and protect them for others if we are not aware of what they are. And I don't have time to go through all 30, but I can briefly allude to some of them quickly here that relates to labor trafficking. So let me give you a little synopsis first. The first one is about dignity and worth of individuals. Clearly, people who are trafficked have been devalued and dehumanized. They're objects. The next cluster here, 2 through 15, address political and individual freedoms. 16 through 17, economic, social, and cultural rights. 28 and 29, the collective rights between nations. It is really important, as we said yesterday in class, that all countries work together. In terms of systems theory, we're social workers. We know that everything is interconnected. If A moves, B is going to move as well. And then the last one, about no one can take away people's human rights, at least on paper. But in reality, we know this happens all the time. People's human rights are taken away from them all the time, and partly because many people do not even know what they are. That's really important to know what they are. I'm going to talk a little bit about just about five of them. Article 3, everyone has the right to life, liberty, and security. In other words, we have the right to not be killed, the right to be born free, to live free, not to be falsely imprisoned, and to be living in safe spaces. Labor trafficking violates this right. Article 4, no one should be held in slavery. That's pretty clear. Labor trafficking violates Article 4. Everyone has the right to peaceful assembly. When people protest their um, trafficking situations or just trafficking in general, we have that right to assemble, to assemble peacefully and to defend human rights, Article 20. Article 22, 
Everyone has the right to social security. In other words, everyone has the right for their countries to offer some type of safety net for them, whether it's disability or retirement, something that would keep them alive and well and functioning. We have that right as humans. Article 23, choice of employment. Can any of you imagine working jobs 20 hours a week, six or seven days a week for years against your will? Many of you have chosen your majors, your discipline, your professions. Can you imagine anything but having a choice to do that? And according to Article 27, we should have that choice as well as equal pay for equal work. And we know that it's not a reality in many ways across the world. 24, the right to, re to let rest and leisure. I, t I kid you not, there are many nights I lay down and I say, well, thank God I'm not a slave. I can actually lay down right now and go to sleep when I want to. So I know that many slaves, many folks who are trafficked do not have that honor or luxury. I honestly think about that all the time. When I think about the cramped conditions in which people sleep when they're trafficked, I think, well, thank God there's not five people laying in this bed with me or on the floor beside me in this hot, crowded room. I think about those things all the time. 25. You know, we take for granted the ability to have housing, food, and clothing. But it is a human right that your governments, our governments, governments around the world should provide these basic necessities to people. And when it comes to trafficking, all of these rights are violated and neglected. And then Article 30, it says that no one can take away your human rights. So we should be morally outraged when we learn that 27 million people around the world have these rights taken away freely, boldly, and blatantly. And good people like you and I, well-meaning people, are complicit in some shape, form, or matter in those rights being denied to people across the world. I'm almost done here. So in terms of my message, do not become a nudist. That would not be acceptable. Keep your clothes on. I'm just saying, be careful of how many clothes you buy. Do not throw your things away. You've already paid for them. If you want to help out the situation here, maybe donate them so the next person can use them and not pay the full price subsequently. Do not choose to live on the streets. I'm not saying get rid of your house or your housing situation. We need to live somewhere, obviously. But be very mindful. The latest research shows that we're living in, in the western parts of the world. We're living in bigger houses despite smaller families. Why are we living in bigger houses despite, despite smaller families? That's a problem. You're going to fill the house up with things, by the way. Do not stop shopping altogether, but be very careful and mindful and conscientious when you do shop. Some things you can do, become a smarter shopper. I would encourage all of us to start looking up the brands that we use, looking up the products that we use, trying to understand the, the, the supply chain for things that we use moving forward. And if you are just cannot get rid of a brand, stop using it, at least keep the producer accountable. Write them emails, send them letters, call them, and tell them and demand that they know and they are accountable for their supply chains. It's not okay for, for the Western Hemisphere to continue to say, I didn't know this was going on in my supply chain in Guatemala or in Paraguay, Paraguay or in Mexico or in China. It is not okay. It is not an excuse that we can accept as consumers. And we know that our dollars speak very loudly. Our euro, CD, all those things speak very loudly. Shop less. Hold companies accountable. Buy fair, fair trade products. You've heard of this term, fair trade products. We need to buy products that are being produced by people in a fair and just manner. It may mean pay a little more, but it's worth it. You can now sleep with the conscious. It is very much so worth it. And download Good On You. It's a really easy app, Good On You. I get ready to buy things, oftentimes put my cell phone up, cell phone out, and look at Good On You to see what the rating is for this particular product. It kind of tells you if the products have really horrible ratings or pretty good ratings in terms of fair trade and being cognizant of their supply chains. And there are several other apps like that as well. So in terms of my summary, my last slide here, 
We all play a role in promoting labor trafficking through our consumption. Let's stop it right now. Let's do better right now. Human rights are for all people. Human rights are for all people, not just some people in some parts of the world, for all people. And the government has a duty to protect its people from labor trafficking. Well, we know that many governments are actually complicit, and that's problematic as well. So I would encourage all of us as free individuals to use our voices, our authority, our network, our competence, our skills to make a, some noise to incite a moral outrage about trafficking around the world and to help set free those 27 plus million people around the world who did not enjoy the daily freedoms that you and I take for granted all of the time. Thank you all. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Jacqueline. You're welcome. Uh, so who would like to comment or make a question? Right here in the front. I don't think so. Maybe be talk loudly. Hello, hello. Yeah. Yep. Uh, my name is Ricard. I'm a journalist from Fumasa. Okay. Um, I wanted to ask you about the fair trade products and how, to what extent can we actually trust this, the fair trade stamp around the world? Um, I've been hearing and investigating a little bit about that, and I know that, well, a few organizations around the world actually have the power to decide what is fair trade and what is not fair trade. And so mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you about that in particular. And that's a great question. Unfortunately, people, some people have found out that if you put the sticker fair trade products, fair trade on your products, that folks would be inclined to buy those products. They would believe in the equity and the justice in producing and exporting those products. And, and what has happened, unfortunately, that some people are applying those stickers when their products are indeed not fair trade. So something that is tended to be good, to be fair, and to be just, is being used by a fraction of individuals and companies that are not sincere or authentic, and indeed are applying and abiding by those expectations. So that is a problem. And I'm not quite sure how to weed out all of those particular companies, but I would say do your due diligence and try to find a sustained record of consistency in fair trade products. And you're right, I can't guarantee you that. But it's a good first start in terms of trying to do the right thing. So thank you for asking that question. It's a great question. I am Rogers from Uganda. So my concern is all about uh, like the prices we pay for uh, goods and products. Yes. and even the reward for the immigrants. I personally happen to have witnessed it. So in the presentation, I remembered, like I happen to have worked in one of the companies as a financial manager. So during the end of the festive season, they were giving out gifts to the staff. So you find a lady who has been working from morning to night, not resting, receiving a bowl of soap and a kilo of sugar throughout the whole year as a gift. And mm. someone who has been just sitting in an office, for example, like me, receiving jelly cans of cooking oils and boxes of soap, and at the end of it all, so you try to wonder where the world is going, and their efforts is not being rewarded. Then my concern is, how sure are we that even t sometimes when we pay highly, the profits these uh, people receive, they don't redistribute them to their workers, that's the biggest challenge. So I can buy a shirt, maybe if it's at 50, I decide to pay 70. By the end of it all, the person making it, there will be no increment at the end of it all. For example, there was a month when we made profits beyond 80%, but the people's salary was never increased. People is continue receiving mm. 2,500 a day as they are paid, so it is never in increased. I don't know what can we do upon that. And he's asking a great question as well. 
Okay, we want to make sure that we buy products and that somehow the, the profits are actually trickling down to the workers. And ideally, if the, if the business owner is not corrupt and the business owner is ethical, he or she would do the right thing. And, 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 I, and I say again regarding his question as well, we can't always guarantee what happens when we actually buy the product in good faith. What we need is more individuals who are conscious in terms of business owners, organizations, who are mindful about doing the right thing and treating their workers ethically and consistent with what the intentions of their products supposedly project to consumers. And I think it's unfortunate when I meet people who work long hours and, for example, never taste the product themselves. How can it be that you work in a field and never taste the pineapple you pick every day or the tomato you pick? I mean, how can that be? Well, unfortunately, there are lots of people who are perfectly okay with trafficking and labor abuses. Even very popular and well-known companies and brands that we all know, we know there are people who do not care at all about the subsequent profits trickling down to the worker. They feel that giving them what little they've gotten is good enough, if any. So I don't know how to keep corrupt, evil individuals accountable. I don't know how to do that. But I think it's awful, and unfortunately, it's very prevalent. So thank you for that question. I don't know how to keep them accountable, except maybe to rise their sense of morality and just injustice. So I'm not trying to be a downer. I'm trying to elevate you all to be very inspired to do something, but it is a very difficult task. This is difficult, and it's very complex. Yes. Hello. Hello. Uh, Thank you for your presentation. It Thank was you. very clear on what we can do as Thank a consumer. You. Thank you. But as a citizen, if I watch a, a problem, uh, if I... Louder? I have an ethical problem. Okay. If I denounce the situation, those workers will be sent away or <laughs> something bad will happen to them. Mm -hmm. um, so, what can I, as a, what, do, what does a good citizen do in a situation such as that? Because I don't want to hurt those people but I don't want the situation to go on. I don't want to live in a country where those situations occur. Mm -hmm. So uh, this is an ethical issue, so <laughs> and that's a I would like question. your comment on that. Thank you, that's a great question. What do you do when there are people in the country who are not legally entered or validated to be there and they're working and being subsequently abused? How do you deal with that? Well, that's also a very challenging task. And unfortunately, these individuals are at the mercy of employers. They're at their mercy. And unfortunately, these individuals, the owners, the operators, know that there's very little recourse to report abuse, to report abuses when someone's in the country um, on a less than legal basis. And so I've heard people say, we should bust up every sweatshop in the country. And the others have said, well, we do that then. What little monies they're earning will go away. And my response to that is, we need to hold co companies accountable. And unfortunately, when we do that, there will be casualties. Some folks will lose their job and their only source of livelihood. But more importantly, the company will fill it more than anybody else. I know that individuals will be hurt, but what has happened when these type of things have come to the attention of groups and authorities, and sometimes it does mean that a shop is going to close down or a company is going to close down and folks have lost their jobs. Because there's such a need and agree to have the profit, many companies will respond, actually, and do something about it to make the, the environments more workable, more, um, more safe. And they may actually hire workers at a living wage or at a little bit of a higher wage. But if you're in Portugal and you see some folks working, being paid under table, not properly out there to be in the country, you're right, you don't want the abuses to persist. But I do think it's important to report. 
I am known for reporting abuses in America. I will call the police station, send an email in a minute to say I suspect this is a case of labor or sex trafficking. And I honestly do with the intention that ultimately this will help everybody in the long run. Although right now it may mean some folks may lose their jobs. But it does come down to keeping greedy, evil organizations accountable. And they do respond to protests. They respond to emails. They respond to bad media coverage. These companies ultimately often will respond. So thank you for asking. And it's a tough situation when someone is here without the proper paperwork. They're truly at the mercy of the locals. Thank you. Thank you. Any last question or comment? No? So thank you, Jacqueline, and You're thank welcome. you for your questions. We will now have a coffee break of 15 minutes, and then we'll uh, continue the seminar. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all.